Hi, my name is Shira Rubinoff. I'm president of Cybersphere, a Futurum Group company. I'm here with Guy Shani, global data security leader, co-founder and CEO of Polar Security. Welcome. Thank you. I'm also joined by Matthew Schreiner, global threat management partner and portfolio leader at IBM. Welcome. Thank you. Please join me as I welcome them for the latest updates on how clients are securing AI against emerging threats and learn how you can start to secure your own generative AI initiative. So Matt, let's talk about IBM's cybersecurity assistant. Right. First, why did you choose the word assistant? And also, who is AI assisting? Well, great question. So we chose the name assistant because that, that is what is happening from a virtual perspective to assist that level one uh, analyst that's sitting in the SOC, the, the kind of eyes on glass on the console. Um, there's kind of two levels to it. There's the sophistication that that assistant is bringing to a more advanced analyst, potentially even up to a, a level two. But that level one, let's say they're a junior analyst, for example, uh, maybe they're new in the role and there's a lot of burnout associated with trying to sift through the volume of alerts and events that are coming into the console. So any tools that you can provide that give them a little additional guidance, support, uh, additional resources are going to really virtually assist and, and help to retain and, and grow that, that analyst to make them more productive in the SOC. So Matthew, can you please share with us a real world example around this? Sure. So there's, there's really two elements. Um, there's what we call advanced threat disposition scoring, which is something we've had in place on our global managed security services platform for about eight years now. Uh, when we launched that in 2018, we were auto dispositioning about 65% of the alerts as they come into the console. We've now increased that up to 85% of the alerts that come in, which is tremendous. I mean, this is the, the main focus of any uh, optimized SOC. You want to reduce that alert fatigue coming into the console. But then from there, since we've implemented this cybersecurity assisted, we're able to um, auto assist or assist another 45 to 50% of that remediation time. So giving immediate context, recommendations, additional resources for that analyst to to uh, drill down on right there for those remaining alerts that still need to be investigated. So you have that initial 85% and then um, you have a 45 to 50% decrease in remediation time from there for that, that level one analyst, which is tremendous. Well, that's super impressive there. Yeah. And uh, the whole process of uncovering cyber threat isn't a single step. How does cybersecurity assistant help across that workflow in the SOC? Yeah, so it's, it's related to what I just described in terms of Again, that uh, auto dispositioning or what we call ATDS that's happening in our platform already, yep. um, all the way to auto recommending kind of steps to remediation. Um, the ultimate goal and the outcomes here are that it starts to up level the quality of the work inside the SOC. And so our goal is to not just add more value to the SOC analyst, our goal is to actually do away once and for all with that level one and eventually that level two uh, tier of analysts so that those those analysts, which are, are prone to burnout, yep. um, that eyes on glass just going through alert after alert, uh, hours and hours, day after day, week after week, to do away with that, up-level those workers into an L3 kind of almost triage remediation role, that, that leads to a much greater job retention. And that starts to address the overall cybersecurity talent sh shortage because it's that L1 and L2 role, which is the number one burnout uh, role contributing to the, that talent shortage. So, and how does the cybersecurity assistant transform the workflow with that type of impact? And you say 48%. That's quite a number. Yeah, yeah. So again, once we've auto dispositioned um, the bulk of alerts from the get-go for the remaining alerts that do come into the console, we're immediately adding additional context. We're able to annotate with root cause in the ticket, for example. We're able to suggest new use cases and we're able to close that loop. So we're not just um, aggregating and deciding what needs to happen next, we're able to take the findings, annotate the root cause, and auto-create new use cases as a result. And so the end-to-end -end workflow in the SOC starts to become fully optimized. And again, that also leads to the up-leveling of the work, the quality and nature of the work that those analysts are doing in the SOC. Well, I don't think people have typically thought about all the things that this can actually do, how it can help a company, how it could bring it to a whole new level that sort right. of transitions companies to have better impact for their organizations. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. So let's move over to Guy for a moment and talk about generative AI. Certainly so many challenges are faced when dealing with generative AI. What do you believe are some of the biggest challenges we all face when dealing with generative AI? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of challenges. AI security challenges start and stop with, uh, with the data. 
So we always say that AI security challenges are in fact data security challenges, but uh, what does it mean? So the number one challenge that um, we see in the wild is around um, shadow AI and shadow data. Mm -hmm. Companies are utilizing more and more the AI in their production environments that are creating AI um, data pipelines. There are a lot of data stages in those pipelines. For instance, um, data cleaning, for instance, data enrichment, uh, training the data and so on. And in fact, the companies, they, they lose control. They don't know where the data is, what models are utilizing the data and touching the data. So that's the number one challenge. The number two challenge is around data access. Now, AI, this creature, now is a kind of a gateway to the data. When uh, an employee utilizing um, HR in chatbot, for instance, this chatbot accesses data, the corporate data, and then retrieve it um, to, the, to the user. So now you have this, uh, in this AI model that accesses data. You need to enforce some policies on what data do they access, where, how, and so on. So that's the number two challenge on data access. The number three challenge is around the um, posture, the posture of this, but the posture in fact with uh, more specifically on the data uh, pipelines that I just mentioned, because you have plenty of um, applications touching the data. You have data stores everywhere, in the cloud, in SaaS, in the on-prem, and you need to make sure that those data pipelines are well protected and not um, publicly exposed, for instance. Well, certainly, I think you highlighted the main piece we talk about in cybersecurity data is king. You know, is access to it, where it sits, where everything is uh, pointing to. And certainly with this aspect of generative AI, you certainly highlighted that for them. Yep. So given your point that securing AI is a data challenge, how does IBM see organizations begin tackling data security for data AI initiatives? So the first step, as always, yeah. is uh, visibility, right? So we see a lot of companies are trying to create um, a AI inventory where they will see all the places in the company in production and also in dev, staging, a, and so on, where the company lies um, AI, generative and AI, the models, the data that uh, is connected to these, and also the um, users and applications accessing to these. So first step is visibility. Yep. Second step is around um, posture. Let's make sure that nobody that is uh, not allowed to access the, the data. Let's make sure that the data stores are not um, publicly exposed, well protected. Let's, let's see what data has been moved from one environment to another. So everything related to the posture of the data. Now, data at rest, is not the only thing here. Yeah. Data is continuously moving between yeah. environments. So that's um, the, the number three, um, let's say, uh, a to do on their to do list on where the data is moving and uh, between environments and so on. So that's the uh, number three thing that we see companies are doing. Oh, very interesting. I like that you highlighted the fact that data is moving. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of focus has been data at rest. Where does it sit? What's going on with it? But data and movement is even more important to focus on and handle it in an appropriate way. So Agree. when I spoke with the IBM team at Think, I was at the Think conference, you shared your announcement of a preview of your IBM AI security offering. What use cases are you helping clients with today? Things that people don't know about. Yeah, so let, let's, let's try to zoom out for a sec, okay? So um, when company wants to protect the AI life cycle, mm -hmm. the company needs to protect three main elements. The first one is, and we talked about it, the data. Okay, great. The second uh, element is the model, the models themselves, because now we have a model that was trained. Mm -hmm. What about uh, if the model was po poisoned? Mm -hmm. Model uh, e evasion, uh, hallucination, and so on uh, on the models, prompt injection, and so on. So. The second step is let's protect the model itself from um, malicious uh, acts. And number three is around the usage. The users and applications utilizing the, the model, governance of those and, and so on. So if we zoom out for a second, these are the three main 
stages or not stages, the, uh, the three main uh, elements that need to be um, secured and protected. Mm-hmm. The data model and the usage. And that's exactly what um, our product does. We are first mapping all the data we're mapping all the uh, AI you have in your environments mm-hmm. um, across the stack, on-prem cloud, SaaS, data warehouses, and so on. Then once you have this visibility, we are protecting the models um, themselves, kind of a firewall against the, um, the attacks that I just mentioned, prompt injection, and so on. And then the governance. Let's see who is using what and how. Very interesting. Something I like to do in my interviews is talk to my interviewees and ask them to give their own personal helpful hint or thought around cybersecurity. And here, certainly around generative AI, AI, what you'd like to share with our audience from your own perspective. And Matthew, I'll start with you if you'd like to share something with us. Uh, well, thank you. I'd, I'd like to share two things, actually. Please? So, so of course, um, we believe that we're just at the very beginning of the adoption of generative AI capabilities. Mm-hmm. And there's so much more to come. We've talked about some of those capabilities and it's like leap forward in terms of uh, efficiencies that uh, we're achieving. But I actually wanted to kind of a- add on to some of Guy's points here. Um, if you've been in technology for a while, uh, all this um, uh, activity and noise that we see around generative AI, there's so much happening. It's very much akin to what we saw in the late 1990s and early 2000s around dot com, yeah. where there was this big rush to get everything online, get your banking apps online. As quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. So you could be first to market and get your IPO and garner investments and so forth. And then we started to see the challenges and the problems with that, where these banking applications were being hacked because they never built security in. They didn't test for security vul- vulnerabilities. And there are some significant parallels now with companies that are building in LLMs. They're leveraging um, various models that, that uh, in the rush to adopt, to, to, in the rush to be first to market, um, they're skipping some of the testing. And so um, our point of view is you have to test. Otherwise, you will fall victim. You have to be testing your AI uh, models. And we have a great solution. And you, Guy, would you like to please share something with our audience as well? Yeah, sure. So I think that even though that's a new technology, cool technology that um, everyone wants to implement and so on, we need to first make sure that uh, everything is secured. But we want the security to be enablers versus blockers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I think that um, having um, a, a, a security um, programs, security um, a, a ideas on how to secure the models, the data involved, and so on is super, super important because I saw it the same in the container um, containers. When R&D wanted to implement containers in production and got blocked by security, and then came the container security, um, the kind of a new EDRs for containers to help with it. That's exactly what um, we are trying to do with the AI. So companies will be able to utilize the um, the great power of AI without risking the security of the data. Thank you. Well, this has been a very informative and very important discussion today. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Guy, for thank joining you. us here today. And we are here at Black Hat 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.